All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the special events team here at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. At any point during the event, you can click on the Q&A to ask a question of our speakers. It's located at the bottom of your screen. And I apologize in advance if we don't have enough time to address all the questions we receive. Uh, we are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, just click on the live transcript option, look for the CC image at the bottom of your screen. Finally, in just a moment, I will be putting the link to Why Trust Science in the chat. It'll take you directly to the Politics and Prose website where you could purchase your very own copy. Thank you again for being with us here and it's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Naomi Oreskes is the Henry Charles Lee Professor of History, uh, excuse me, Professor of the History of Science and Affiliated Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University. Oreskes will be in conversation with Frank Cesno, who serves as the Director of Strategic Initiatives at George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. He is the creator of Planet Forward, a multimedia storytelling platform, and the host of the podcast, Healthy You, Surviving a Pandemic. Thank you so much for being here. Take it away. Thank you, um, Chelsea, and thanks to Politics and Prose. And Naomi, it's wonderful to see you. Wonderful to see you. Thank you for being uh, willing to be here with us tonight. Well, you know, you couldn't have written a more timely book, uh, released in a more timely way. Um, and I want to welcome um, all those uh, who are joining us, the participants, and reiterate again that if you've got questions, please use the Q&A function because um, to the extent possible in this virtual world, we'll engage in a, in a, genu a genuine conversation audience and author here. Uh, but you and I have a great opportunity to start. And um, I, I want to start, Naomi, by asking you, you know, when you started your work, when you started your research and asking the question, you know, why trust science? Did you have any idea that you would literally end up in the bullseye of American politics and culture the way this topic and you have? Well, obviously not. I mean, clearly, I didn't predict that we would have a massive global pandemic, that this would be one of the most uh, serious public health crises of the century. Uh, so in that sense, no. And of course, when I started doing research in history and philosophy and epistemology of science, which is now 30 years ago, obviously didn't know then that this would be a hot topic. Uh, most people didn't think that. But on the other hand, there was a context to this work that was political right from the get go. Part of the reason I wrote this book was because I've given, I counted the other day, in my career, over 400 public lectures. And in the last 10 years, most of those lectures have been about climate change. And one of the questions that sometimes comes up when I give a talk about climate, the history of climate science, the work that scientists have done, sometimes there will be someone in the audience who will ask, sometimes in an open way, sometimes in a belligerent way, well, that's all well and good, but why should we trust the science? And so it was that question posed by people in my audiences that made me feel that, oh, you know, this is actually a legitimate question. This is an important question. We tell people so often scientists will say, well, the science says this or the science says that, or maybe a political leader will say, I'm listening to the science. But there is this fundamental underlying question, why should we trust science? And so I had the idea to try to write a principled book, a principled answer to that question. So, you know, it's interesting because I'm from the world of journalism and we've experienced so much of this ourselves recently, right? Fake news. If we don't like what we hear, we call it fake news. And, and frankly, you know, the media gets attacked from left and right and has over a long period of time. But, you know, I, I, media runs the gamut, right? From traditional journalism with editors and fact checkers and gatekeepers to this kind of untamed wild west of bloggers and conspiracy theorists and cable channels that are driven by opinion. Science is supposed to have a method, right? Mm -hmm. Science is supposed to have peer review and all these things. So why hasn't that sufficed, Naomi? Why is science on so under siege? Well, I think that's a very complicated question. So I'll try to answer it on two levels. The first level is what the book is all about, that there is no scientific method. 
the idea of a singular scientific method, which if followed will give us truth, just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Science is complicated and the, the natural world that we study is complicated. And so part of the reason why scientists have trouble communicating is that this actually is a very complicated subject. And we can't simply say, well, you know, we did this experiment and it proves that this is true. And so scientists find themselves challenged when asked to answer questions like, well, how do we know climate change is real? How do we know masks work? Because in fact, the answers often are complicated and there isn't a simple scientific method, one method that answers all questions. And so the first part of the book addresses that. And the whole first chapter of the book is looking at this question of scientific methods and trying to explain what some of the methods, plural are, that scientists have used, which then leads into the question, well, why should we trust those methods? But there's also this larger political and social context. Part of the challenge that scientists have faced is the challenge of deliberate disinformation of people who don't want to believe scientific results because it threatens them. It either threatens their economic interests, it threatens their political ideology, it threatens their social affiliations, or in some ways threatens their worldview. And my previous book with Eric Conway, Merchants of Doubt, was all about that. The deliberate attempt to sow disinformation, doubt, and distrust among the American people about that, science. That, that would be this book. That oh, I was thank you. <laughs> thank you for that shameless plug, right? So, so, you know, the problem is operating on two levels. There's a, there's a sort of what we could call a genuine intellectual or epistemological question. And this book is about that. And then there's this broader background of the political and cultural challenges, which is what my other book is about. Throughout the book, um, you pose, and I, I, I highly recommend it on so many different levels. It's, it's, it's fantastic and, and, and so important and timely, as I said, but you pose some big and very provocative questions. Um, and and in, one, in one place you write, should we trust science? Mm -hmm. And if so, on what grounds and to what extent? What is the appropriate basis for trust in science, if any? Give people some sense as to, as to where, you, where you go with those. Yeah, well, thanks for that, because that's really the that's the crux of the book. The book is trying to answer that and not to simply assert science is true. I mean, some of you may have seen the bust up on Twitter a couple of weeks ago when Neil deGrasse Tyson says science is true, whether you like it or not. Yeah, well, that's actually not right. And I don't <laughs> want to just be. Yeah, I don't want, you know, all due respect, but you know, he's a better astrophysicist than he is an epistemologist. Right. So I don't want to just say to people, you know, we're the experts, you know, trust us. It's like there's that wonderful scene um, in Ghostbusters where Bill Murray bursts into the room and says, stand back, we're scientists. No, that's not adequate. And that's deeply disrespectful to our readers, to the American people, to the public. So I wanted to have a more nuanced approach and not to say, yes, science is all good or science is all bad, to say, well, what is the basis for trust in science? And that could lead to an informed and honest discussion about the times when maybe we would be justified in not trusting science. So the short answer to the question has to do with the processes that scientists use to vet claims. So I don't believe science has one method. I think no historian of science would say that that's a defensible position. But what we do see as a common thread among all the different sciences throughout history is a process, a set of processes actually, I should say, for vetting claims. Peer review is the most famous and the most important, but it's not the only one. When scientists have an idea and they think the idea is supported by sufficient data, they expose that idea, that claim to critical scrutiny of their peers. And they do it through workshops, through conferences, through peer review, and through the process of scientific work where other colleagues will try to use that work in practice. And it's only claims that have gone through that process of critical scrutiny and survived, it's a kind of trial by fire, it's often pretty tough. It's the claims that have withstood that scrutiny and stood up over time that we call scientific facts. And so it's that process. And so then, so that's why I think we should trust science, because I think history shows, experience shows that in general, that process has proved highly effective. And many of the claims of science have proved to work well in the world. So science has a track record of success. And it's that track record that it gives us the basis for trust. So we can trust science because our experience tells us that in many cases, this process works very well. 
And but then it the, also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, say, but then it also invites us to examine cases where it doesn't work so well. And that's the second chapter of the book is that critical examination of cases where things didn't work out and what we might be able to learn from that. Science has made mistakes and science is built on uncertainty and all that. And I want to come back to that, but I want to stay <clears throat> with what you were just now talking about, because to get to that prop, that point of challenge and to survive that that process of challenge, whether it's conferences or peer reviews, or just scientists taking shots at one another and picking them apart because they do that. You know, you, you point out quite rightly, and I think and hope a lot of this audience understands this, that science is supposed to be based on observed facts. And as you point out, the principle of verification. But why then, and in fact, you're right, verification gives us the basis for evaluating what is or is not justified true belief. But if science is based on observed facts and verification, why is it so challenging to convince people that they can trust those facts? Is it that they don't understand what science is, you think? Is there too much arrogance with the way scientists address the public? Why, why are we having this gulf of doubt? Well, I think like a lot of things, this is a complicated question in which the answer is all of the above. So there are obviously many components that can feed into public misunderstanding or distrust of science. But if you look at the scientific evidence about this question, what you find is that there actually is not a general crisis of trust in science. If you look at public opinion polls, what we find is that the majority of the American people, probably something like 70 to 80 percent, depending on exactly how the question is worded, do actually trust science and scientists broadly. And in fact, a really important recent study by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences showed that scientists are actually one of the most trusted groups in American culture. The only group that consistently performs better in questions about trust is the military. And scientists rank far higher than, I'm sorry to say, the media, which unfortunately is not well trusted, Go Congress, financial institutions. So many, many institutions in the United States are much less trusted than the institution of science. But what we do see is that there is rejection of science in very specific areas. And the big three areas for which we have clear and compelling evidence are evolutionary biology, climate change, and now this issue of vaccine hesitancy and mask resistance. And that's telling us something really important. People are not rejecting science generally, but they are rejecting area and science in specific areas that have been politicized. And so that tells us that the most important driver is in fact politics. So this is a good topic for the politics and prose bookstore. It's politics. And Many people who write about science or who are scientists themselves are reluctant to talk about the political dimension because a lot of people don't like politics. They think it's ugly, they think it's messy. And some people are even attracted to science because of the perception that it's apolitical. Many scientists I know will say that. They say, I went into science because I hate politics and science is about facts and politics is all about opinion. Well, unfortunately the, the world often doesn't give us what we want. The deliberate politicization of science, particularly what we've seen this year with the issue of mask mandates, and also over the last nearly 30 years now with climate change, has led to a political polarization where people reject science, often on the basis of their political affiliation. And that's a very unfortunate state of affairs, but that's what the data show us. Were you surprised, just playing on that for a moment, that the, the, the general response, and in, so, in many cases, the anti-science response to COVID played out the way it did. I mean, this is not climate change, which is decades, maybe centuries in the future, it's something you can't see or feel. This is about people getting sick, dying near you, around you, maybe God forbid, related to you. W did that surprise you that, that that continued to follow that pattern? Well, sadly, no, I wasn't surprised because this follows, this recapitulates the pattern that Eric Conway and I talked about, about merchants of doubt. I would say I was disappointed. And I'll recall one anecdote that's relevant to this. So I remember very clearly back in March, a reporter who was on the climate beat called me and said, well, you know, people have always been saying that the problem with climate change is that it's far away in time and space. Well, first of all, I just want to be on record as saying that that's, of course, not true. Climate change is here. It's now. It's happening in front of us. And we still don't seem to be able to get our heads around it. But it is true that it's kind of abstract in certain ways. And the connection between climate change, increased greenhouse gas 
and suffering and pain and loss in our lives, that connection is real, but it does involve a couple of steps. So I, we can't just say, oh, climate change killed yesterday. You know, three people died yesterday from climate change. We can't quite say that in the same way that we could say that three people died at the hands of the police or 100 people died at the hands of gun violence. So in that sense, climate change is more challenging. So the reporter said to me, so people have always said that about climate change, but now we have this very clear, very present imminent threat to life. And will that cause people to respond differently? And I said, well, we're about to find out. <laughs> so that was a good answer. Right? <laughs> because, yeah. You're, a good, and, you're a good scientist. You built a little uncertainty. Into exactly. That. <laughs> and we'll do the experiment. So we've done the experiment and we've seen. And so sadly, it does recapitulate the same patterns of political polarization we've seen before. And for many of the same reasons, the same arguments about so-called big government, the same arguments about individual rights, the same arguments about, you know, the the classic false dichotomy of jobs versus the environment or jobs versus health. We've seen all those same arguments used here. So no, it doesn't surprise me. It does disappoint me. And it, but it also tells us how incredibly important these issues are, right? Because rationally you would have thought that when someone's health and safety is in imminent peril, that that would be a wake up call and that people would abandon ideology for facts and that if they wouldn't do it in that situation, then when would they ever do it? Well, we've seen the answer for something like 25% of Americans is that they won't abandon it. And so this is what I say, the transformation of ideology into pathology. What begins as ideological and something that we might disagree with, but we could at least understand, like, you know, somebody doesn't want their taxes raised. Right. Now it's become pathological. You're right about the consensual view of science. What is that and how does it address the trust issue? Well, the consensual view of science emphasizes who it is that's participating in the processes of critical scrutiny that we talked about a few minutes ago. So when scientists put forward claims, it's not a person evaluating and there's no judge that sits on high and says, okay, submit your claim to me and I'll decide. Rather, Scientific claims are vetted by communities of fellow experts. And what we call scientific facts are the claims that have been vetted and accepted by those communities of experts to the point that there is a general consensus that the claim is in fact true. Now there's two things that are important about that. It's a different view of science than many of us hold. Many of us were taught a very individualistic view of science that focused on the individual genius who comes up with a great idea. Well, there are geniuses in science, just like there are geniuses in art or literature or other areas of human endeavor. But in science, that's just the beginning of the story. That's just a kind of first step. The more important part, in my opinion, is the process of vetting. And that's a very pluralistic process. And that matters because it means that, yes, a journalist could find a dissenter to get on television and argue. But what I'm saying is that what we call scientific knowledge, the stabilized claims, are not the opinions of individuals, but they're the outcomes of this process involving many, many people. And so, you know, a sort of simplistic way of viewing it is that we have the saying two heads are better than one. Well, it's like that, except it's not just two heads, it's 200 or 2000 or 20,000. And so this is why when it comes to climate science, for example, I mean, there are, there are dissenters, most of them are not scientists, but there's a handful who are. And this is one of the troubling things about the media, as you know, that some of your colleagues, I know, of course, you would never do this, but some of your colleagues practice false equivalence, where they'll get a scientist on television to say, yes, climate change is happening. And then they'll trot out some dissenter to say, no, it isn't. And the audience is left confused. The audience is left with the impression that there's a big argument going on. The realistic representation of that in the media would be to bring 99 scientists on the screen and one dissenter. And of course, John uh, Oliver did a very fun sketch about that a couple of years ago. Um, that, of course, doesn't fit well in the media framework, but that's really what we should be thinking about. And so as citizens, if we're confused about an issue, we shouldn't be listening to some individual person who's trotted out on television, but we should be trying to find out, well, what is the consensus position of the scientific community? And this is, of course, what groups like the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, attempts to do when they write these weighty reports. And that was why it was such a beautiful moment when Greta Thunberg 
testified in Congress and one of the, you know, one of the members asked her, well, well, why should we listen to you? And she said, I'm not asking you to listen to me. I'm asking you to listen to the scientists. And she submitted as her testimony, the IPCC special report on two degrees of warming. I thought that was a brilliant move because it showed her own understanding of how this process works. So that was a beautiful out of the mouths of babes moment that this you know, young person uh, gave a better representation of science to Congress than many of our own scientists have done. You know, fortunately, I think we have much less of the false equivalency in the media than we have had. I, I think many have moved past that. In fact, there's been a very big change in the way the media are covering this issue, both mainstream media and, and others. Um, but it does continue to show the, the, the big divide, right? There was a recent Gallup poll that showed two thirds of Americans worry a lot or some about climate change. That's, that's two thirds, okay? Now that's still a third who don't. And the, when you look within, there's a huge polarization, Democrats, independents, and Republicans. But nonetheless, there is some sense of, of coherence here. And I'm just wondering, you know, from your studies and in your book, um, do, you, do you even need to try to move the whole public? Mm. And how do you explain the disconnect, maybe this is politics again, between two thirds of opinion someplace, but an entire party in, in terms of climate change that at least institutionally does not embrace it? Well, exactly. And this, of course, recapitulates problems that we see across American politics more broadly, that there's a very big disconnect between what the American people want and what is going on in Washington, D.C. Well, and the and science course, they have absorbed. Right, I mean, exactly. They, they obviously are listening to the science. Correct. Right. And I think, level. right. I mean, that's one of the grounds for optimism here, that if you look at public opinion polls, what you see is the American people, by and large, have not been duped. The American people, by and large, understand that climate change is real. They understand that it's caused by human activities. And they understand that if we don't do something now, we will be in big trouble because, well, I mean, we're already behind the eight ball. We should have started in 1992 when the United States signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. But technological change takes time. Social change takes time. Changing habits takes time. So we need to do this right away. And the vast majority of the American people get that. And, and in fact, as you said, I mean, we don't have 100% agreement about anything in life, and we don't expect it in most areas of life. So if we were having a debate about, let's say, the death penalty, we wouldn't expect 100% agreement. We would expect that there would be value-based differences. Part of the problem with climate change, though, I think, is that scientists themselves have become really stressed about the 20 to 30% because they have this expectation of consensus because that's what they seek and that's what they achieve in their own work. So I think scientists have made a, a sort of mistake in thinking, well, we have this broad consensus in the scientific community. There's essentially no real disagreement. And therefore, they expect there to be a comparable kind of agreement in the American people. But that's an unrealistic expectation in my mind, because when the American people think about climate change, they're not just thinking about the facts. They're also thinking about what, if anything, we should do about it. And the minute you get into politics, you're immediately, of course, now moving into the space of, well, do we do something about this? And if so, what? And that's when all the value considerations, all the preferences, all the worries about taxes and everything else, those are all going to flood right in. So I think we should expect that there will be disagreements because it's not so easy to untangle the facts and the decision making about it. Uh, but on some level, though, this has also been exploited by the merchants of doubt because they have tried to use scientific disagreement and uncertainty as a means to block action. And that's why this has been so damaging, because then that has spread to the Republican Party, where we see this massive alignment of the leaders of the Republican Party with climate change denial. And that's partly why we're so stuck. It's not because the American people don't get it. It's because our leaders, um, well... They're in a, I don't know how to describe it exactly, but our leaders have backed themselves into a corner and now don't seem to know how to get out of it. And, you know, it's really worth pointing out here, by the way, that science gets itself in trouble with both the left and the right. I mean, take GMO, for example. Science will say, no, it's safe, it's fine. But the progressives and, and, and plenty of folks there pound on the other side. I mean, it's not that they're it's without. Yeah, I, I would object to that a little bit because I think that is a little bit of false equivalence. I mean, I think it is true that the rejection of science certainly can cut in many different ways. Um, and there is certainly vaccine hesitancy among some, 
you know, people who would be identified as left wing or progressives. Yeah. But actually, the GMO issue is a good example of how different problems get conflated. So it isn't the case that science lines up to say GMOs are all great and fine. What is the case is that when it comes to the question of whether or not genetically modified organisms are safe to eat, it is true that the scientific evidence seems to say, yes, they are. That's but of I'm course, prefer. opposition to GMOs isn't, isn't just about food no, safety. No, I, it's correct. about a whole lot of other things as well. The food industry would like you to think it's just about food safety so that they can then make the argument that the anti-GMO people are being anti-science. But in reality, of course, many of the objections to GMOs have nothing to do with food safety. And this is a good example of these issues that are actually complicated. There's a lot of different things going on. And so, you know, it's difficult sometimes to articulate this in a soundbite or a tweet, because it does take a bit of time to work through what's really happening here. What role does science play in all? What responsibility does science pl have in the situation, the trust, the trust deficit that we've got? I mean, science has blown it. You, and you, you, have, you tell wonderful stories in your book, of eugenics. Horrific, right. right? The limited right. energy theory, right? That women can't go to college because they're spending all that brain power. They're not going to be able to have babies or the continental drift or other, other things. Um, others will say that, that, that scientists too often are, um, you know, walled off, arrogant, what have you. So how do you see the, 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 the role and responsibility of science itself and scientists contributing yeah. to this? Well, I think there's two things. I mean, the first thing I always want to say is that um, this is not a project of bashing science. I think by and large, when I think about the broader context of the work I've done, I see scientists as largely victims, right? If you think about the merchants of doubt story, I think most scientists did their job well. They answered tough scientific questions. They gave that information to political leaders. They tried their best to explain it properly in multiple reports of the IPCC, but they faced an organized disinformation campaign uh, from you know, primarily funded by the fossil fuel industry, working with libertarian think tanks. And, and most scientists were completely, you know, had no idea how to respond to this because it wasn't in their training to even recognize what they were facing, much less to know what to do about it. So by and large, I'm, I'm not blaming scientists for what we're facing. I'm really blaming the people who have been the sources of disinformation. That said, <laughs> you're absolutely right that in the book, I do engage with this question of times that scientists have, as you said, blown it. And, that, and there, I think that one of the important things that these episodes do for us is we can start to answer that question that you quoted me on in the beginning. What are the conditions under which we should trust science and what are the conditions under which we might be justified in having a healthy skepticism? And what was fun about doing that part of the book was I didn't actually know the answer myself. It was a genuine investigation to try to think through, well, what the heck would the answer to that question be? And what I came down to was a few things, but the two most important had to do with consensus and diversity. So the first one we've already talked about. In most of these cases where we can look back and say that scientists blew it, what we find is that actually there was not a consensus, that there was important, rigorous, and empirically informed dissent by people in the scientific community. At the time? At the time, at the time. So it's not just hindsight. So eugenics is often cited as a case in point, but in fact, there was a vigorous debate within the scientific community about both the scientific facts of how much we really knew about how much genes controlled complicated things like human behavior, and also about the policy interface, how much these, this scientific information should be used to inform policies. And we say, see the same thing with the other cases that I look at. And so this is why I come back to consensus as a crucial criterion. If there isn't a consensus, if there's real dissent among real experts, then we should be cautious. And we might want to say, well, we need more data. Or we might want to say, well, this is an emergency and we have to make some cho tough choices, even though we recognize that the information may be incomplete. Um, but if there is a consensus, then that's when it's time to move on and say, OK, so there's a legitimate question now about what to do about this. You know, do we want carbon pricing? Do we want to ration fuel? You know, do we want a mandate to switch to electric cars? But that moves us then away from the science and into the policy domain. Right. And we're back to that again. Right. And then could I just say one more thing about the diversity sure. point? The other point I make in the book is about diversity. 
So that's, a what key- I was gonna, that's actually oh. what I was going to ask oh. you. Okay. Because, perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> We're a good team. <laughs> so a crucial part of the argument that then came out of this research was about the importance of diversity. And it was really nice for me because I've obviously always believed in diversity you know, from an ethical standpoint. But I realized in writing this book that there was a really, really important intellectual argument for why diversity is important. Because one of the things we sometimes see in these debates where we would say scientists blew it is that either the community was not diverse or the voices of diverse people were not listened to. And so this becomes a very important argument for pluralism in science, that if we have a diverse community where people can look at a problem from a number of different angles, and if those voices are genuinely heard, then the chances of making a really big epistemic mistake are reduced. Because often mistakes come when we look at a problem from only one particular angle and we fail to see the other aspects of the problem. But when we have a diverse community, then we can look at the problem from many different angles and approach it with different methodological filters. And then we have a better chance of finding the truth about the natural world. So diversity it. becomes not just an ethical good, but actually an intellectual good. And I, and I would tell people who are watching, who are thinking about buying the book, you have a very interesting point that you make about feminism and the connection that you found in feminism to science. And I'll, I'll let people go and read that and find that out for themselves. Perfect. But uh, a couple more, and then I wanna go to the audience questions and, and because there are several and they're great. And if you've got some, please put them in the Q and A function and I'll, I'll pose them to, to Naomi here. But Naomi, you know, I, I come, as you pointed out, um, and I'm still, you know, in recovery from it. I come from the world of journalism and media. And the world of journalism and media has gotten harsher and faster and much more opinionated and much tougher uh, over the years. <clears throat> it focuses much more on the conflict and, and, and than, on the, than on the consensus. And I think of this notion of uncertainty in science and how fundamental it is. And in the media and in our political sphere, in social media, uncertainty is not only not embraced, it is flat out rejected. And how much more difficult does that make it for a discipline that not only revolves around, but must embrace uncertainty because that is the very nature of the research and the discovery of science to begin with. That's why things change. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it's one of the reasons there's a kind of clash of cultures between science and journalism. And I think it's something that journalists really struggle with to know how to handle. And it's also important for ordinary people to understand as well, because the demand for certainty puts scientists into a kind of impossible situation. And, and the politicians, by the way, that the journalists cover and quote, they're not into uncertainty. I've never heard a politician run and say, you know, it may turn out this way or it may turn out that way. Right. But, you know, I mean, that's not what they say. That's not what wins. Right, right. And, and you're absolutely right. Uncertainty is crucial for science. It's what drives inquiry, right? If we knew everything, we could just say, okay, we're done and we go retire and play golf. But it's because there's so much we still don't know that we still have, that science is alive, that we continue to do research. And of course, it's part of the honesty of scientific debate that we talk about the uncertainties we're honest about what we don't know. We're honest about the weaknesses in the data sets. And of course, that can be both deliberately exploited by people who have an interest in doing so. And it can also be misunderstood by people who, who think that because it's uncertain, therefore it means we don't know anything. So I think there's responsibilities on all sides here. For scientists, I think scientists have to do a better job of leading with what we know. As a journalist, you've probably seen that a lot of times scientists lead with the unknown, they'll lead with the uncertainties, the caveats. And of course, this makes sense from a scientific standpoint because it's, the, it's what you don't know that drives the inquiry. So as a scientist, what you don't know is the interesting part. But that's really confusing for a lot of people. So I think scientists need to kind of get over themselves a little bit and, and say like what the public needs to know from us is what do we think we really know about this issue and start with that. Who does and that then if, well? Who does that? that? Do you know, can you point to somebody who, who does, does that, that well? really well? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Does, does, <laughs> I guess that does, shows does Tony problem. Fauci do that well? I think pretty well. I think he's done a pretty good job, although I think on the mask thing, he kind of dropped the ball a bit too. You know, there was a lot of bad communication in the beginning about masks. We, you know, we're not really sure, blah, blah, blah. But that was really silly because we have 100 years of experience to say that masks do help spread, you know, control the spread of respiratory viruses. Um, 
Yeah, that's a good question. I know in, this, in the climate community, there's been a big discussion about trying to do this. Um, Susan Hassel has been very good at giving scientists examples of how to do it. Um, who does it really well? I think the late Steve Schneider yeah. stood at it. Uh, you know, I think Gavin Schmidt is usually pretty good. You know, I have to be careful here because I don't want to, you know, offend people by not mentioning them. But I think it's really, really hard for scientists. Um, but I think journalists on the flip side have an obligation too to recognize that this is a challenge and, and maybe even to say to scientists, well, let's start with what you know. You know, what are the key, what are the three key take homes that you would like people to know about this issue? Right. That right. might be a way to frame it that could help. And policymakers have an obligation to be responsible with what they do. And, you know, we know how that works out. So right. and, to, and, and for all of us to realize, of course, it's uncertain. But, you know, in our own personal lives, we make decisions all the time. You get married. You don't know if it's going to work out. You take a job. You're not sure if you're going to like your new boss. You know, you enroll in a degree program. It's going to cost a lot of money. I mean, in daily life, uncertainty is just normal and we don't get excessively stressed about it. We don't say, oh, I can't get married because there's no guarantee that this is going to work, right? So there's also this sort of weird disconnect that we seem to be demanding of science, something that we don't demand in the rest of our lives. I, I want to go to some of, the, some of the very good questions we've got now from our wonderful audience here. And uh, Manoshi asks, to what extent do you view groupthink hmm. to paint the pure idea of scientific consensus? As a practicing scientist, I know that there are certainly dogmatic scientists in the bunch, and they could, in theory, lead their scientific community into corners. Droop thing's a real thing, and I do think that it's important for scientists to be alert to that issue. But again, I think that the evidence cuts the other way, that in general, we see scientists um, erring on the side of overstating the uncertainties and not, in general, on the side of exaggerating them. And yes, it is true that individual scientists can be incredibly dogmatic, but I think that that's not actually that big a deal. If the process is working as it should, a scientist can get up in, in a scientific conference and argue as adamantly as he or she is able for that position. And I think that's okay. I think it's okay for scientists to be an advocate for their own arguments so long as they're participating in a community where there's an opportunity for other people to say, well, hold on a minute, slow down there. And I think most of the time that does happen. I myself I had a very shocking groupthink experience when I was first working um, as a professional geologist. And so it stayed with me in my whole life and I'm very interested in this problem. But that was actually in an industry setting and the pressure to sort of get on board wasn't coming from the scientists who were actually doing the scientific work in my company. It was actually coming from our boss mm -hmm. who was under pressure from what we used to call the suits, right? The, this was in Australia. You know, the guys in Melbourne who were putting pressure on us to have a definite result that they could take to the bank. So in that case, I don't think the pressure for the group thing came from the scientists. I think we actually were really pushing back, trying to find out what was really going on. But we were in a social context that made that hard. And that's another reason why understanding the social context of science is so important. It's so important. Peter has a question. He says, is science a religion, it's the word he uses, that can be verified, duplicated, and tries to correct its errors and theories to understand the universe's laws better? Well, I would certainly say it's not a religion because it's not faith-based, and or at least it shouldn't be faith-based. And you know, this relates to the first question. I mean, obviously individual scientists can become religious-like in their attitudes. And we certainly have seen, we certainly have examples of scientists who have a kind of almost cult-like defense of their practices, which I would obviously disagree with. But I think, you know, again, I, I like to think about science more as an institution. It's an institution that has practices, that has a history, that has a culture. And there are certainly aspects of those practices and cultures that we could criticize, but there's also this very robust track record of success. Right. All right. Here's, a, here's another one. Upton Sinclair is, David writes, Upton Sinclair is quoted, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. I suppose that could apply to a woman now, too. Uh, what are your thoughts about... I don't know. It only applies to men. Oh, I see. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So, what, what are your thoughts about our social media environment where there are incentives for people to create controversy and an information, or if I may add, disinformation echo chamber? Yeah, there's no question that's a challenge and a problem. 
And certainly one of the things we've seen around climate change denial is that a lot, a great deal of climate change denial is funded by the fossil fuel interest industry that has a huge financial interest in not knowing what scientists know. Um, so this is a big problem. And I do think social media, social media didn't create this. I mean, we've had propaganda and disinformation long before we had Twitter and Facebook, but I think there is good evidence that it's made it worse. And particularly the report that came out, I think it was just a week or two ago about how something like 60% of the disinformation on Facebook about vaccines was coming from 12 sources. And so that's you know really shocking, right? It tells you how incredibly powerful social media can be as a megaphone for disinformation. But on the other hand, there's also a silver lining to that. If it really is only 12 people or organizations, those people could be stopped. And this is where I do think Facebook and other social media outlets do have an obligation. I know Facebook is working on this and I've actually spoken with some of the people there. I think they are trying to figure out how to do this properly. And I am sympathetic to their arguments that it's not always obvious you know, where the disinformation is coming from or how you make that call. But I think in many cases, it's it's pretty obvious, you know. And so I do think that organizations like Facebook have a responsibility to identify uh, sources. If there is a source that's consistently representing disinformation or presenting disinformation um, to stop that. Do you think it's gotten worse? I mean, Galileo had some bad days. <laughs> you know, I mean, science yeah. has has you know has always been been very difficult. Certainly, creationism and all and and, and evolution clashed long before there was social media, right? Right. So, are we just much more aware of it? Is it just noisier now, or has do you think fundamental trust in science eroded beyond where controversies have you know always? Uh, sort of developed. Yeah, well, you know, again, I'm a historian, but originally trained as a scientist. So I always try to go back to the data. And I actually had a chart ready for exactly this question. So one of the really interesting uh, questions about this comes from the general social survey, which has been going on since 1973. And they have a question about trust in leadership. And if you look at the data about trust in scientific leadership, it is completely unchanged since 1973. Now, that's a very shocking fact. I don't think that's what most of us would have guessed. So it tells us that our instincts about many of these things may actually be wrong. We get impressions from social media or from whatever mainstream media we read or watch, but often those impressions are incorrect. And so we could scramble to try to do something, say, to fix social media on the, on the theory that that's causing the problem. When in fact, well, we don't even actually, we haven't even got a clear definition of what the problem is. So the way I view it is, Science will always have the potential to rock the boat, to challenge the interests of people um, in positions of power. And the Galileo story, of course, is that. It wasn't fellow scientists who went after Galileo. It was the Catholic Church, which was, mm -hmm. in effect, the government um, of his community at that time. It's not fellow scientists who have, by and large, created the problem for climate scientists, although there's a few. But it's, it's people in positions of power in the fossil fuel industry and in libertarian think tanks that are well funded by regulated industries. So there's always that potential. I mean, it's what we conventionally say it's about speaking truth to power, that science is about discovering things about the natural world. And sometimes the chips fall in places that powerful people don't like. I mean, the scientists who started working on climate change back in the 1950s, they weren't setting out to change the world. In fact, most of them weren't even environmentalists. Most of them were not even Democrats, right? Um, and this is, again, a little known fact. I mean, Charles Keeling, who's, who started the work that became the Keeling Curve, I mean, I knew him. He was a traditional Montana Republican. But sometimes you discover things that you didn't set out to discover. And when that happens, it can, it can threaten powerful people. And so I think we have to recognize that there will always be this potential. And we have to think about how do we protect science from pushback from powerful interests. Um, but in terms, again, as I've said, in terms of the American people, I think the polls show that by and large, the American people are still on board with science. And so we don't need a giant uh, remedy or a giant fix. You know, we may need some mid-course corrections. I think the scientific community can do more to try to understand some of the values-based objections to things like evolutionary theory. And some of those objections can be addressed with better communication. 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big anti fan of Richard Dawkins. I think anyone who goes around saying that Christians are idiots is not helping the case, right? <laughs> you know, um, so we have people in the scientific community who don't help. And I think it would be useful if more scientists, well, you know, I, I was at an institution that gave Richard Dawkins a big communication prize. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, what in the heck are we doing? This guy does so much damage. And it's partly because many people in the scientific community don't actually understand the values orientations of people who are reluctant to understand or accept evolutionary biology. So people in science have to do a little bit more work to try to be empathetic, to understand the sources of concern and not to throw fuel on the fires of things like creationism. I have a, another very interesting question uh, from, from someone. Do you think that part of the problem, uh, uh, wait a minute, oh, jump down back, sorry. Uh, it's much easier when we're all in a room. Somebody's got it a hand on my call on them. And I, know. I know, and I'm like looking we here at my... Yeah. I'm okay at this. I can read. Here we go. Do right. you think that part of the problem is that science is so complex that to much of the public, it's close to magic? Mm. Like what percentage this person writes and asks, what percentage of the public actually understands how the internet works? What is electricity? Uh -huh. How do rockets work? I suspect it's a relatively small percent. At some point, does science just become hard to swallow? Yeah, that's a great question. I've gone back and forth myself on this because honestly, you know, one thing I sometimes think about that I don't feel like I really understand, like really truly in my heart is actually sound. Like how sound, like think about a conventional vinyl LP. Like how the heck does that actually work, right? It's kind of unbelievable when you actually stop to sit with that. Whereas I do feel like I understand light bulbs. That somehow for me is like more intuitively obvious. So I think this is a tricky one. I think some aspects of science are actually not that complicated. And sometimes scientists make it seem a lot more complicated than it really is. And maybe that strokes their egos to say, oh, it's so complicated, you couldn't possibly understand it. Or maybe scientists are just not good communicators or, you know, I'm a lot of scientists are a little Asperger'sy, you know. Um, but often I feel like these things are not actually that complicated if you take the time to just think for a few minutes about what kinds of explanations can work, what kinds of metaphors make sense. But you're right, there are aspects of science that are very, very complicated and they're not easy to explain and definitely can't be explained in a tweet. So that's where we have to do more work and we have to take the time to say, okay, you know, this is complicated. And then if you, you know, like in a situation like this, I mean, my argument in my book is obviously more complicated than what we're able to discuss in this hour. And that's why I hope you will read the book and engage with the bigger, deeper argument and the evidence behind it, because that's the important point. And, and one thing I always say, and I've said this many times in my public talks, I think it's not enough for scientists just to explain what we know. I think scientists also have to explain how we know it. Mm -hmm. Because if you can walk through the people through the process of discovery, very often that you end up in a better place. And I've certainly seen this with my own students. If you explain how scientists learn certain things, that stays with people much more than if you simply declare, you know, here are the 10 facts that I want you to memorize. Well, this actually cuts to something that, that I talk a lot about. And I, 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 it sounds very simple and I'll state it and it will come, up, come out in an oversimplified way. But I, I think, and please feel free to disagree with me on this if you think I'm wrong, but it's about storytelling. Mm, there yeah. is something about storytelling. Someone who discovers something, who never thought they were going to, or what, what you're up against when you don't, or what the result is when you do. That, that's not just a series of facts. It's not just a series, it's not, not just a you know, connecting jargon. It is, it is bringing people through a thought process and, and through a, 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 a human journey that is actually very exciting, sometimes incredibly frustrating. It does, it can be a lifelong obsession mm. to discover this one thing. And then, but when you put it in that context, it, I, I find people react to it and relate to it in different ways. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, I think we've known this for a long time, but I think it's hard for scientists to accept this. And I think it's partly because scientists have been raised to think that what they do is not storytelling. In fact, right. I, I used to teach a class that was called facts and stories, right? Scientists are raised to think that facts are actually the opposite of stories. And so we give you the facts. And if you ask a scientist to tell a story, you know, what many scientists hear is you're asking them not to tell the truth. To make it up. To make it up, right? That stories are made up. And so the idea that, no, that storytelling is a, is a structure, 
and that there are true stories and just like there are you know there are fictional stories and there are non-fictional stories but that when you want to communicate with people telling it in the context of a story i mean I don't know that we understand the cognitive science of this well enough to explain why this is, but I think we all know, we, we all know intuitively that people respond to stories. And I think all good journalists know that. I think all good filmmakers know that. And any scientist who's spent time with journalists or filmmakers has learned it from them. Well, I had an assignment I used to give my students called Dazzle Me a Statistic, and they needed to take a data point. <laughs> nice. And, 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 Think about what it means and craft a narrative around that. Mm. But it's all about celebrating the data point. Nice. And, and actually, I wonder if I can share my screen. I don't know. It might be too complicated to try to do this. But um, let me just see if this works. Just give okay. me one second. All right. OK, I think I can do this. Yep. Can you see that? Yes. So this is the graph I was telling you about a minute ago. So it's not a data point, but it's a line. But I mean, this is really an amazing line, right? Because most of us have this perception that things have changed dramatically in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And yet this graph tells us that it hasn't. And so there's a story behind that. And it's a story that we haven't entirely figured out yet. So it, it leads perfectly into the next question um, from, from one of our attendees who asks, so <laughs> do you think better and deeper science education would help address this mistrust? Mm. Does that ignore the underlying cause of the problem? If yes, what do we cut out of the curriculum and find space for more STEM? Yeah, so the answer to the first, the question in the first part is no. One of the things that gets me a little riled up is when people think the solution to this is more science education. <laughs> Actually, what we need is more education in history and philosophy of science, right? And, and to their credit, I have to say, the National Center of Science Education, uh, who I work with, has recently launched a unit on the nature of science. One of the things they've realized in their work uh, with school teachers on teaching evolution in the classroom, it's not enough just to give people more facts about evolution. But if you give students more information about how science works, and in particular, if you point out that science doesn't address the existence of God, that you can accept evolutionary theory and still be a religious Christian or whatever, um, that these kinds of things do help because you're now actually getting at the underlying concern. Most people who reject evolutionary theory don't reject it because we don't have enough evidence to prove that the eye evolved. That's a red herring. They reject it because they think that science, they think that scientists are claiming that evolutionary theory proves there's no God. But of course, that's not what scientists are claiming. Evolutionary theory cannot have a position on the existence of God because it's not a scientific question. So if you can teach people about the nature of science, and if you can use history or philosophy or sociology, storytelling, literature, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, we have tremendously wonderful resources for thinking through these questions, but you don't generally get those in science classes. So if we were in politics and prose right now, and I were not in my study and you were not in your kitchen, we'd have an opportunity to have some follow-up questions from some in our audience. So we've got one person who's already asked a question, Manoshi, who has a follow-up question, and it's a great okay. one. So I'm Good. going to pose it to you. Good. So Manoshi says, thanks for asking, answering my first question. <laughs> You're um, welcome. But another one, it seems like there's a difference in time scale between the time to reach scientific consensus and the time on which uh, decisions have to be made on policy, for example. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how to reconcile those differences? Man, there's yep. a lot of difference there. That's a great question, and it's absolutely true. There's often a sense in politics that we have to make a decision now, today, this congressional session, where it may take scientists a year, five years, 10 years, 30 years to sort out a complicated scientific question. So I have two answers to that. One is that that's true, but it's also true that in politics, we waste giant amounts of time. And in the time we've been debating climate change, you know, back in 1979, there were scientists who said, yeah, well, you know, we could wait and see, but if we do wait and we do see, it'll be too late. Well, I, for years, I gave a public talk that ended, well, we have waited and we have seen. No, so actually in this case, our perception that the political process works faster than science turned out not to be correct. Politics turn out to be just as slow and, and cumbersome and lugubrious as the science. So it's not necessarily the case that science is always too slow. But the other thing I would say is I would I invoke the framework of adaptive management. So the whole concept of adaptive management is that we learn as we go and we can 
adjust in response to what we've learned. And of course, this is what the pragmatist philosophers said that all life was like. I mean, this is what John Dewey was famous for. We learn by experience, we learn by doing. And if we're smart, you know, then we take on board what we've learned and we adjust our beliefs in light of those experiences. So we do this in ordinary life and we can do it in, in the interface between science and policy as well. And we have a good example of that from the history of the ozone hole. So when scientists back in the late 70s realized that these chemicals we were using as refrigerants and, and propellants for hairspray had the potential to eliminate life on Earth completely, they realized that we couldn't really afford to wait and see. That if we did that, you know, it'd be like the famous line in the long run, we're all dead. So it was not plausible to say that we needed to wait 10 or 20 or 30 years to find out for sure. And so what they argued for was an immediate uh, action to control these chemicals, the so-called chlorinated fluorocarbons. And in fact, policymakers did that. And that's the Montreal Protocol to protect stratospheric ozone. But one worked. of the, and it worked. And we are here today and we are not suffering from cataracts and massive sunburns uh, because policymakers actually acted on good scientific information, even though there were a lot of uncertainties at the time, including even fundamental uncertainties about the basic mechanism by which these chemicals were destroying ozone. So, and actually a, another shameless plug, if you're interested in this case study in my book, Discerning Experts, we have a whole chapter about this case. And it's a really, really important case because it was successful. <laughs> so, um, but one of the things that was built into the Montreal Protocol was a mechanism to adjust it, to make the rules either more or less strict if new scientific information suggested that the problem was either not as bad as the scientists thought or perhaps worse. Well, guess what? It turned out it was worse. And the Montreal Prime, the protocol was tightened up. The uh, time frame for phasing out the CFCs was accelerated and it worked and we did it. And the ozone layer is now recovering. We're so almost, this, oh, sorry. So this is a good example of how we can practice adaptive management, even in a complicated scientific domain. Uh, we're almost out of time. And there's so much more we could talk about, but instead of doing that, I recommend that people uh, go to politics and pros and buy lots of books. Uh, but I do want to ask you this question. I, 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 I've interviewed authors many, many times through my, my various roles in, in media, and I love interviewing authors. And I have a question I always ask of authors. When you wrote this book, as you wrote this book, as you came through this process, was there something more that you learned, some surprise that, that developed, something you didn't expect to think about in the way you thought about that, that helped you transform your own thought and, 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 and shows up in some fashion in the book or has come to you since as you, as you yeah. thought about it and discussed it? That's a great, great question. I think it's what we've already touched on with the issue about diversity. When I set out to write, to re, to write this book, I didn't have high in my mind that what would emerge would be a strong argument about the intellectual importance of diversity. But in writing the book, I went back and reread a lot of work in history and philosophy of science that I had read before, in some cases had even taught. And one of the bodies of work was feminist philosophy of science, feminist epistemology. The feminists had been arguing for a long time that if you bring women or people of color or other people who have been previously missing from the scientific enterprise, if you bring them into the fold, they will bring perspectives to science that are useful and helpful and the science will be better. And in rereading that work, I had a kind of light bulb moment where I thought, oh, this is it. This is the crucial argument for why diversity is so important, that it's not just a sort of social good, but that it's an epistemological or an intellectual good. And so that became a central argument. In a way, it became kind of the central argument of the end of the book was to say that we do have reason to trust science so long as the communities are diverse and so long as we have evidence that those diverse voices are being heard. Central conclusions. Uh, last one, and then we'll let Chelsea come back and say thanks to everybody. Um, uh, so I had an opportunity to, to talk with Michael Regan, the new EPA administrator, a couple of weeks ago. And he said, science is back. We're going to be driven by science. You know, are we done with this or uh, is this just a moment in time? Yeah, well, of course, we don't know. It's like the early one. We're going to we're about to find out. right? <laughs> um, we know that Joe Biden is president now for four years, and we know that a lot of good can be done in four years. And we know that changing course is important 
in large part in politics because of the momentum, the cultural and social momentum. So I think, you know, the ship of state is a big battleship. It's hard to move, but I think that actually Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have done an incredible job in a short period of time actually moving the ship of state and really pointing it in a different direction. And so I'm cautiously optimistic that and especially because, as you say, because the American people are behind this, that we are moving now in a better direction. But, you know, fingers crossed that it becomes sustainable. Well, let us um, conclude our conversation. I'll thank you and thank the scientific community, because without science, we wouldn't have the vaccines that we've got that are being deployed on this very day. So, you Naomi, bet. it's great. Congratulations. Great book. And I highly, highly recommend it. Thank you I very much. Chelsea, back to you. Well, thank you so much. I could have listened to another hour of this wonderful conversation. I'm sad that uh, we have to come to a close. Thank you both so much for being with us tonight. Thank you all out there in Zoom land for joining us as well. Uh, your patronage is what enables us to bring such fabulous programming like this. And we can't continue to host events like this without the book sales to support them. So I would encourage you uh, to visit the link in the chat to purchase Why Trust Science on the Politics and Prose website. While you're there, you can check out the events page. Uh, we hope to see you at another event in the near future. In the meantime, please stay well and well read. And thank you again. Take care. Thank you.